identity has impacted what I think about the world. Okay? The reason why I'm doing this, saying this is I think, personally, this had a huge reason for the start of World War II. This idea of identity. Alright? In order to do that, we're going to have to go right back to even before Napoleon. So remember World War One, which we learned all last term, happened 1914 to 1918. We're going to go back right at the start of the 1800s. And if I was to draw a map of Europe, just as a circle, you've got kind of Russia over here, you've got kind of England over here, and France, and, and Italy's here, and, and what you've actually got in the middle is not Germany. What you've actually got in the middle was a whole hundreds of little different principalities, fiefdoms, little kingdoms, a whole bunch of them. And this area in the middle is some of the best land in all of Europe. It's got some of the most productive mines in it, and it's got some of the best, most fertile fields. But a whole bunch of different kingdoms really didn't have any sway in any of the politics at the time. Which meant that whenever these guys fought each other, often what was happened is they'd fight each other here. It's exactly what happened with Napoleon. Napoleon came, smashed all of Europe, took out Austria, took out Italy, took out all these other these kingdoms, and he took Germany, and he said, you know what, Germany's no longer 300 odd. He turned it into, I think it was 38 main ones. So we're talking 1815, 1814 kind of area, time. One of the main ones was Prussia. He had a whole bunch of other ones, Württemberg, Bavaria, down here, which you guys think of. If you think about it, if you think about what Germany is, you're probably thinking two types of kind of images. One's from Bavaria and one's from Prussia. Someone give me an idea of what, what comes springs to mind when they think of Germany. Nazis. Nazis? Let's go Beer. take Nazis out of it. Beer. Beer, Lederhosen, yeah, etc, etc. That's from Bavaria. That's from Bavaria. That's a very laid back kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, they drink lots of beer, they wear funny clothes. Yeah, the women are all blonde with the, with the braids, etc. Yeah. What else? What's the other thing that's completely opposite of that? Big sausages. Big sausages from Bavaria too? Yeah. What else? Yeah, no, they, they get their massive bratwurst and stuff. I know what he's talking about. That's all Bavaria. What's the other kind of German kind of image that we get in our head? Cars. What's, what about the cars? The quality of the build. Oh, really? The engineering. Unsurpassed engineering. Everything runs like clockwork. Yeah? Everything is, is to the minutia is perfect. German engineering is absolute perfection. All right, you have timetables. You get every, you cross every T, you dot every I. That's Prussia. Prussia was the biggest of these, right? Okay, and what we have, what we see happening is as time progresses, what we actually get is we call it. Unification. Germany unifies. And normally when a country unifies or something happens, it happens from below. A whole bunch of people get together and think this is what's going to happen. That's not what happened with Germany. Germany was unified from above. Very cool dude called Otto von Bismarck. Just imagine the most German looking dude you can, that's Otto von Bismarck. Massive white moustache, like portly builds, very gruff guy. Brilliant, very smart. But also a bit of a tool as well. His neighbours didn't like him because he used to ride his horse to their property and rather than getting off his horse and knocking on the door, he'd shoot the windows out of the house to get their attention that he was down waiting for them. Like he, he was a hard drinking, very German, brilliant kind of statesman. He's the one that kind of engineered this thing. He's Prussian. He's, he's, he's kind of second in charge in Prussia. Prussia has a king or a kaiser. Prussian Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm the First, and that's that's actually where the word king comes from. Caesar, yeah, everyone knows Caesar. Kaiser, that's where it comes from. Kaiser means king. Right, so Kaiser Wilhelm the First really likes Otto. Otto basically manages to engineer 
unification. He does it by doing this. You've got Austria down here, you've got Prussia up here, you've got Denmark up over here, a little area called Schleswig Holstein here, which is kind of part owned by Denmark, part owned by Prussia, and you've got France over here. And then you've got a whole bunch of little kingdoms left. What he does, because Austria is really involved in a whole bunch of these areas, Bavaria and Württemberg and the like, they, they really like Austria. They prefer Austria over Prussia. So what he does is he starts a war with Denmark over this area, Schleswig-Holstein, and he wins. Prussians are very militaristic. Their weapons are the best in the world. Their artillery especially is brilliantly made. They're very militaristic, very well trained. They're pretty much where, if you're thinking the Nazi war machine and the World War I war machine, the best trained army in the world, that's these guys. They, they beat Denmark and they basically say, you're gonna have nothing to do with our country ever again. And Denmark goes, okay, fine. Then he starts a war with Austria, okay? It's called the Austro-Prussian War. He smashes Austria. Rather than absolutely punishing the living daylights out of them, he simply says, you're going to have nothing to do with us ever again. But when he takes on Austria, he manages to beat them in such a way that these guys go, oh, okay, and they join. So he manages to get a couple of the southern guys to join Prussia because they now know Austria's got nothing to do with them. They're not going to get any help from Austria. Austria has signed a statement saying, we won't help you in any way, shape or form. So he's managing to get a little bit of influence now. A couple of these states are joining in. What does he do next? He manages to get one of his diplomats to go to France, who's like the old enemy, and using something called the Ems Telegram, gets this telegraph that basically says, we had a meeting with the French kind of ambassador, we talked about this, this, and this, we agreed on this, and then we left. And he gets this telegraph, and he goes, you know what I can do? And he actually literally kind of edits it. He takes a couple of keywords out. And what it looks like is that Prussia massively kind of dissed France. To the point where it's such an embarrassment that they've done that. And then he publishes it, sends it to newspapers. It gets published. France is up in arms. They, like, people are trying to stop a war happening, but they're pretty much calm. He's pretty much put them in a bind where they have to declare war on Prussia for this affront that this ambassador came and said this and then stormed off and basically they invade. Now, these guys aren't with Prussia, but they're even more not with France. So they go, well, we better ask Prussia for help. And so Prussia not only goes in to take on France, it swallows up the rest of the German little, other little half states, okay? Unifies Germany and absolutely smashes France. They were thinking France was supposed to be the best continental army in Europe, supposed to be the best land army. Remember, this is Napoleon's army, who, who 100 years or not even, 1815, 70 years before, 65, 55 years before, smashed four or five countries at the same time. All right, they're supposed to be the best. Seven weeks is all it took. Why? Their technology, the artillery, made by Krupp, K-R-U-P-P. -P. All right, they still make guns today. They absolutely smashed them. Where did they sign? Where did they sign the, uh, the special agreement? That building started with V. Versailles. So they absolutely smash them. They go to Versailles in the palace, which was a, a, made by a, a French a king back in the day, and they sign this humiliating agreement. Basically says, we'll take a big chunk of France here as well, called Alsace-Lorraine, all right, pretty much your best land, most, fer uh, most kind of fertile land, we'll take that, and you have to agree not to have anything to do with us again, basically. Pre pretty harsh piece, all right? France hates him for it, absolutely hates him for it. Get a, they get a kind of marginal line here, it's called, where they basically just fortify that whole region. And they hate Germany. Germany starts what, what's called the Second Empire. The Second Empire. Another word for rule, the Reich. 
1871, we've got this new glorious empire. Remember, what have they got here? What's in here now? What did they have though? Good land. Massively good land. Really fertile land, really good mines. And they're now unified. So Russia's over here. Russia's like a sleeping giant. They call it the big bear of Europe. Okay? Huge. Heaps and heaps of men. Basically, it's medieval. No technology. Autocratically ruled by one dude, the Tsar. Most of them are farmers. Most of them are basically slaves on the land. No, no real technology whatsoever. But you don't want to wake it up. That's the, that's the idea of a sleeping bear. Yeah, You don't want to wake it up. So... So Germany is now one big unified country. And we saw last term, didn't we, how France and England are a little bit worried about this. Germany starts getting more and more soldiers together, starts getting power, starts making money, starts an arms race with England for the Navy, remember? And then World War I happens. Is everyone there so far? Everyone's following? What's this got to do with identity, you might say? What the, why don't we start with, with identity? I think identity, especially national identity, is incredibly important. National identity, even especially back then, was really important. It mattered that you were German. It mattered that you were French. Okay? And if we're taking a big picture, if we're looking at these countries, big picture, we could really go, okay, well, what's... What's France like and what's Germany like? What are some things that typifies, that kind of stereotypes what, a fr what France is like? When did France become a country? Anyone know? Just before the 18s? Yes, the 1780s. So late 1780s, we have the French Revolution. They used to be ruled by a king, etc., etc., etc. They took over and basically they started with all these kind of ideas which America ended up taking, of individualism. In other words, it used to be the king's the most important dude in the country and everything happens for the king. These guys, the French guys, said, no, 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 the state should exist for the individual. Australia should do what it can for Mackenzie. Should do what it can for Josh. It's there to serve Josh. The, part, the Prime Minister and everything, they're there to serve the individual Australian citizen. Individualism. That's how you break up the country into the individual. And the individual should be free. Liberty. It's not, it's not religious at all. It's quite secular. All the, all the priests and stuff, they were supporting the king. We kicked them out. So there's this idea of the secularism. There's this we separate God out. He's not important in any way. We're individuals. We, we like the liberty. That was the French way of doing things. Germany, completely different. Germany is very authoritarian. You've got person in charge is in charge for a reason. You do what you're told. You got that? You do what you're told. They know what they're doing. You do exactly what you're told when you're told. What does that help? What does that help with? It helps with the army, doesn't it? Yeah? You want a really good, well-trained, drilled army? Or well, if everyone has in their culture, you do exactly as you're told, then all of a sudden it's easy to train troops. Very, very strong Christianity. The church is pretty strong in Germany. It's kind of Protestantism came from partly from Germany. Martin Luther went to Germany. He was protected by German princes when Rome and Italy wanted to take him and call him a heretic and burn him at the stake. He went to Germany. A very strong kind of so. So we've got these kind of very different ideas here: liberty, authoritarianism. But you exist to serve the state. You exist to serve your family. You are part of the unit. You're not an individual. You're a part of a family. You're a part of the state. You work to serve the state. The state will help you. 
the state, when it goes well, you go well. Can everyone see that these are very much the opposite, almost, ideals? Everyone see that? Now, what happened in 1870 when France took on Germany? Who won? Germany. Germany. Germany won. So if you're German, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, I did as I was told. We beat those liberty-loving, individualistic, secular, thinking they're the best people in the world, French. How did we do it? Did we do it because we have superior technological... No, people don't think that way. They think German ideals won. Yeah? We read our Bibles, we did as we were told, we marched, we won. Germany is the best. Everyone following so far? National ideals. All of a sudden you're like, we are just amazing. 1871, all of a sudden all these other little kingdoms come together, we're unified as one. Prussia has unified us. And we are doing what we're supposed to do, and look what happens when we do what we're supposed to do. We win. And following on in 1871, what happens? We have some good harvests. We have a whole bunch of really good years of mining. And our stock in the world just goes up and up and up and up. How good are we? Then what happens? Well, one happens, doesn't it? The all-conquering, the mighty, the best land army in all of Europe fights for four years, gives absolutely everything. Mothers sacrifice their lives with their kids. They sacrifice literally their kids' lives. They send the kids off to war. They work in factories. They have rations that are incredibly strict. They give everything. They sacrifice everything. They do exactly as they're told. And they're told for year after year, we are winning this war. We are winning this war. The papers, which are heavily censored, say, we are winning this war. Give a bit more. Give a bit more. Give a bit more. Give a bit more. And then... We lost. Boom. We lost. Who am I? Oh, I did everything we were supposed to do. Everything we were supposed to do. We lost. You can imagine them feeling pretty upset about this, can't you? Yeah? You're reeling because the Allies didn't even make it into our own territory. They were literally still in France. They hadn't even crossed the border yet. And we gave up. We lost. Well, then people start saying, well, we didn't lose, we gave up. They hadn't even made it into, into, onto German soil yet. And then you've got all of these wounded, disillusioned soldiers coming back who've been affected by communists because all the communist Russians went over to fight against them and then they've stopped and there's a whole bunch of soldiers there and Bolshevism, communism, is rife to the point where that's the reason why they stopped in the first place. The German Navy in Kiel said, we're going to send our ships out on one more glorious mission. We're going to go out all guns blazing. And they're probably going to smash us, but we don't care. We're going to go out and take on the British Navy. We're going to beat them against all odds. And guess what the soldiers said? Get stuffed. And then mutiny. They set up a soldiers' council. Very communist idea. And they basically said, we're not fighting anymore. We're done here. We've lost the war. That spread throughout all of the armed forces to the point where they had no choice but to capitulate and say, we've lost. So all these guys come back and you're struggling as a country. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? What, what are we going to do? Well, here's our answer. You saw it, didn't you? At the end of the term... We're going to go to the exact same place where that was signed all those years ago, if I spell it correctly. We're going to send our delegation with all of our you know, lawyers and all the evidence saying, this is a joint thing, this war was joint. And what are they going to say to us? 
They're going to say this whole thing was your fault. The whole thing was your idea and you have to bear all guilt. Not only do you have to bear all guilt, we've made a treaty without you. We're not even letting them off the train. We're going to make a treaty that says it's your fault. You lose 10% of your entire country and all of the best land. And also you have to pay a ridiculously huge amount of reparations back to us. We'll take your means of making it and we'll still demand it of you. How do you think these guys are feeling? Absolutely reeling. Like, whoa. Not only that, we have decided, Germany's decided, what we're going to try out is something we have never done before. We're going to have a democracy. Maybe that'll, maybe that'll make them a little bit less kind of, you know, they'll, they'll go soft on us if we have a democracy. So we've already started this new kind of system of government, democracy. Never tried it before. Never happened. These guys, you know, America's had it for 300 years, 200 years, sorry. All right, we, no, not even close. Not even, 150 years, whatever. A long time compared to us starting it in 1918, literally. Okay? So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, if we go through the list of events, then there's heaps of them. Huge problems for Germany. Every time they try and do something, all right, the way they've set their democracy up is, well, it, it, you get a proportion of the vote. So if everyone in this class votes, and five of you vote for one party, and three of you vote for another, and everyone else votes for someone else, one of you, the way it's split up is the members of the House get five, three, one, 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 one. So there's never a majority. There's never a majority in Parliament. So every time something really hard happens, the group that has five, who are a coalition with the five, and three of the ones, they disagree, they argue, they disband a government, everyone has to vote again. This time it's four, four, one, 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 one. Someone forms a government, a four, and a one, and a one, and a one, and a one. Something hard happens, boom. Can't agree, disband. No more government, everyone has to vote again. Every time there's an election, people die. There's riots in the streets. There's the communists, there's the right-wing fascist soldiers that came back that hate the communists. They're just literally shooting each other in the streets with the old World War I stuff. This is a country in upheaval. Absolute upheaval. What are they going to do? What's happened to them? They had hyperinflation. How did it happen in the 20s? Basically what happened was um, they couldn't pay all their reparations back, so France took the last bit of their good mining area, the Ruhr. They came and they occupied it. A whole bunch of soldiers, French soldiers, came and just said, we're going to take whatever you make, we're just going to take it until you've paid us back. The German government goes, everyone stop work, just stop it. Just go on a massive strike. Stuff them. Suddenly, no more money. What are we going to do? Let's print more money. So they print a whole bunch more money, which is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. Inflation is the con is a simple concept of a dollar is worth something, and over time, that dollar is worth less. I used to buy a loaf of bread after church, growing up, two bucks for two loaves of bread. How much does bread cost now? Two fifty, three dollars That dollar, back in the 90s, is not worth anywhere near as much as it, as it used to be. Why is that the case? Because there's a certain amount of dollars in the economy, and that makes that worth that much. If you put a whole bunch more dollars in there, all of a sudden the dollar isn't worth as much. What if you print heaps of money? Well, all of a sudden, people realise that money is almost worthless. And that makes it even worth less. And then worth less. So people were going to buy bread with wheelbarrows full of money. Children were playing with money in the streets as paper because it was cheaper than getting actual paper. That's how cheap, that's how, how much inflation. People used to get paid two or three or four times a day. Because if you got paid the same amount at the start of the day, at the end of the day, it was worth half as much as it used to be. Within eight hours. Huge problems. The government struggled massively with that. What do you think happened? Disband. Everyone gets back together. One of the guys started saying, I'm going to use this emergency power. Emergency, that's Article 48 of the Constitution. I'm going to force things through Parliament by using Article 48. Alright, and he used it. 
Bruni was his name, hyperinflation. What happens after hyperinflation? They kind of get it together towards the end of the 20s, then all of a sudden, what hits? Starts with great, but it wasn't. Depression. The Great Depression hits at the end of the nine, no, 29. It's a big problem for Germany, because Germany borrowed a whole bunch of money from America to get back on equal kind of footing. And then the Great Depression happened, all of them were called back with their interest. Germany was stuffed. Germany had unemployment of 33% at one stage. One in three people in Germany didn't have a job. They were struggling, absolutely struggling. So I want to ask you, if you're a German citizen, if you've gone through all of this, the side, Treaty of Versailles, being your fault, your national identity, you're doing as you're told, you might start asking yourself, what's the point? We've tried democracy, it doesn't work. What's the point? You know what we need? This is what we need. We need strength. We need someone who's actually going to do something. Even if it breaks some eggs, even if some people get hurt, I don't care. Someone needs to do something. Now there's this uh, guy that was a World War I veteran, he was injured, he's very brave in World War I. He comes back and he's working for the army. He's working for the army in the early 20s and what he's doing in the army is he needs to go out, he's supposed to infiltrate far right national kind of groups and see if they're dangerous or not. And talk and go back to the army and say, those guys are pretty dangerous, I'd go and disband them. Those guys are just nothing, they're just talking the talk, they don't worry about them. He goes to one, they call themselves the NSDAP, National Social Workers Party. And he goes there and he hears a bit of it. And look, he likes what they're saying, but they're not very well organised. And you know what he decides to do? Leave the army and join the NSDAP. Rebrand it. He joins the Nazis. He reorganises them. He tries to actually take over one of the state governments. He actually literally tries a coup. And it fails. A bunch of people die. He gets taken to court. He stands there before the judge. The judge is on his side. The judge knows this is what we need. The judge is a right-wing guy. He stands before the judge and he basically says, this whole thing's a joke. This whole thing's a joke. That government is a joke. He starts saying things like, you know what? This is a joke. We didn't lose World War I. We was stabbed in the back by by the Jews by that ancient enemy that all Germans have kind of in there anti-Semitism they stabbed us in the back the Treaty of Versailles should not only be not kind of upheld we should actively work against it it's a joke he gets five years by the judge which is in kind of under house arrest almost. He's got his own little prison kind of headquarters. He's got his own secretary there. And he dictates to his secretary and writes Mein Kampf, My Struggle. He comes out of jail a national kind of figure. And he leads the Nazis to victory after victory in the elections. Never taken a huge amount, but they're the biggest party. And then eventually... We have a huge fire in the Reichstag, in the national parliament, and he uses that as an excuse to invoke Article 48, like Bruning did before him, and he passes what's called the Enabling Act. The Enabling Act is, I'm in charge. This is an emergency, I'm in charge. Parliament now doesn't matter. I will hold these emergency powers until it's necessary and everything's finished, and then I'll give them back. Does he ever give them back? No. Okay? That's a very abridged version of what we've got. Now, you might think to yourself, well, why did people listen to him? Have a think about it. Have a think about their national identity. They used to be great. 
They used to be the strongest army in the world. How? By doing what you're told. By not asking questions. And all of a sudden, you've got a man standing there saying to them, I will restore you to your former glory. All that stuff that happened, all of that is the fault of someone else. It's the fault of the Jews. It's the fault of the English. It's the fault of the, the, fault of the French. It's the fault of the Russians, the dirty communists. We need to be number one again. We need to rise from these filthy, backstabbing ashes over here of the last couple of decades. We need to rise, and we'll do that by you doing what you're told. Just do what you're told. See some dodgy stuff over here? Different minority groups getting sent away to camps or various other things. There are certain necessary measures that need to be done. But I'm a strong man. I will do what's necessary and we will rise and we will take our place at the top. And we'll do that because Germany is the best. You all know it. You all need to wake up, unite and actually go and do this. And that is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. All of a sudden, the Nazis are making hard decisions and a lot of them are, are coming off. A lot of them are coming off. He's just getting stronger and stronger as a country. He's building massive autobahns. He's saying it's for all of the industry to go to different places, all of the trucks. You know what else it's good for? Tanks. It's great for tanks. He's ignoring the Treaty of Versailles. He's retraining the army. He's remilitarizing the Ruhr, that, that region between France and Germany, which is supposed to be a demilitarized zone. No, no, a whole bunch of Germans there now. France is, is not doing anything about it. Why? They're struggling with the Great Depression. England's struggling with the Great Depression. America's struggling with the Great Depression. They've all got their own problems to deal with. And so Germany's going from strength to strength. And this guy, this strong man, he's doing stuff and he's getting results. I mean, sure, Jews are disappearing in the middle of the night. Sure, homosexuals, political enemies, communists, they're all being taken away and put somewhere else. Sure, human rights. But you know what? There's prices to be paid. 